Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, am I yes, audible sir. And, and is my side, side show uh, visible? Yes. Yes, Please, sir. sir. Right. And I let me see if it's recording. Yeah, so good afternoon, all of you. Good afternoon. And uh, it's my pleasure to be with all of you here and share my views on in digital humanities. And uh, this is an upcoming field for India. Uh, however, in the West, it has uh, taken its ground. It has taken its roots from past uh, three or four decades. Uh, so it's a relatively new thing for us, given the fact that even uh, digitality is a big deal for us even today. I mean, it's not uh, so much part of life as it is for the West. So given this, uh, this is a new emergent area for us. Uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about uh, some of the ways that you can start thinking about digital humanities. Uh, and uh, uh, to do that, I would like to first thank Dr. Saikat Benerji of Gnosis for giving me an opportunity to share my views on digital humanities with the larger academic community. So uh, this is how we proceed. Uh, many of us who are actually listening to this, many of uh, the audience now would be below the age of 30, 35, and they would uh, classify under what is known as digital migrants. Uh, I'm sorry, digital natives, while ge my generation, people who were born before the digital uh, revolution actually set in India, uh, are called digital migrants by critics like Prensky. So this distinction is useful because uh, when, when I say migrants, I am somebody who is trying to find my feet in new digital world. Some, uh, unlike many of the people listening who are born in the digital world. So this is the distinction that we keep in mind as we proceed uh, to think about what we mean by digital humanities and the intention and the timeline and the overview of this presentation is going to be something like this. Uh, I will be introducing uh, the evolving and diversified field of digital humanities by giving a historical overview of the shift that has happened from humanities to digital humanities. And uh, while giving you an a historical overview, I will also touch upon some basic activities of DH and typical research projects undertaken in the field of digital humanities. And we will end with thinking about the relevance and how digital humanities as a discipline uh, is received or what way is it relevant to us in our context, in Indian academic context. So this is a, a kind of a overarching uh, flow of the presentation. So when I say evolving and diversified field of digital humanities, it means that there are many things which are changing very rapidly in the field. At the same time, it's diversified. It does not mean that there is a single kind of activity that is done under digital humanities. So when we say diversified and evolving, it means that it's not a static thing that we have to reproduce in Indian context. It's a kind of uh, something that is being played out even today and given the speed of technological revolution and the change that happens in technology, uh, whatever we will be thinking has to be begin from the basics of it. So that's what we will do in the course of this presentation. Uh, so before thinking about digital humanities, it's a good idea to think about what do we mean when we say humanities in the first place, because even if we have vague ideas about humanities, uh, it's better to have a clearer picture of the larger discipline to which we belong as students of literature and arts and culture. So humanities, uh, according to Stanford Humanity Center, defines it as the study of how human beings process and document the human experience. Since humans have been able 
uh, to do that, we have used philosophy, literature, religion, art, music, history, and language to understand and record our world. At the time, at the same time, we have been trying to make sense of the world in which we are trying to live our own lives. Uh, so humanities technically studies uh, this whole range of ways in which human beings uh, record and process their experience as human beings. So it's a kind of umbrella term, as Stanford uh, Humanities puts it. And knowledges of all these records of human experiences give us an opportunity to feel a sense of connection to those who have come before us, as well as our contemporaries. So. Uh, it's good idea to think about what we mean by humanities in the first place. Uh, humanities study human beings and how human beings record, make sense of their experience, their imagination and their expression through various modes. So you can see that even humanities is a diversified and evolving discipline. Uh, however, unlike digital humanities, it has begun fairly early. So it's a good idea to take a look at historical development of humanities too, as we try to engage with the question of digital humanities. So typical, typically what happens in uh, humanities and as students of literature, we are, if you remember, what do we do when we study literature is where we look at the text which have come to us as our primary material, very often literary text, paintings or whatever, the whole range of documents that come to us, which we classify as uh, primary material. And then we also draw upon uh, the methodologies as well as the knowledge produced by studying these documents, which is something called the secondary material. So that is how typically literary studies under humanities have evolved. However, humanities began uh, in the beginning of the last millennia uh, with the emergence of print archive and printing technology that has made the production of primary material for us as students of literature possible. So that's how we get Shakespeare in printed editions. Uh, we get Milton, we get Chaucer and the usual uh, things that are taught in colleges and schools have come to us through printing. So printing revolution is one of the important developments in the development of humanities itself. Other thing that we often uh, think about when we study literature is that there are methods and procedures for editing these texts. The Shakespeare that you studied in your college or school have undergone various processes of textual editing, including comparison of multiple manuscripts coming up with textual variation and coming up with uh, reliable textually credit critically edited uh, texts. So all these processes, however, are not something that we study in our undergrad or postgrad program, but these are specialized form of scholarship that I think in India we should be knowledgeable about. However, we are not. The other aspect that in, is involved in uh, study of humanities is storing of information as well as the documents, something called libraries in brick and mortar traditional libraries that we uh, use to study, especially to find out secondary material regarding the text that we are studying and the whole domain of publication. So you can see that the traditional humanities that uh, we are exposed to, the traditional humanities under which we study literature has all these various domains of scholarship uh, and all of them seem to revolve around printing technology, uh, including our uh, pedagogy in classroom. The modes of generating knowledge involve thinking cri critically, asking questions about linguistic styles, the genetic conventions and artistic devices about the treatment of various themes, questions about ideology, representation and about historical context. So these were some of the methodological approaches that we often uh, use while we studied literature in our classroom. However, uh, all these developments have not happened overnight and uh, nor have they happened in one place 
where uh, we usually study our literature in our colleges it has it has begun in the west and the emergence of humanities in the western society with the rise of print capitalism as benedict anderson calls it and the growth of what is known as public sphere became some of the important historical developments in the West where these processes of studying humanities uh, evolved for a great deal of time before coming to India through colonial education. And the questions that uh, were asked to these texts and to this material, literary material, cultural material, was usually associated with the ideological processes that went in production of these texts, like the questions of class, like the civil society, like enlightenment modernity, scientific positivism, as well as questioning and the questions of what is known as imagining nation and the questions of nationalism. So all these ideological developments and the questions that we ask to literature are also produced by the same social process that produce humanity. So you can see the link between our methodology as well as the modes of producing this text, more modes of consuming this text, modes of producing knowledge about this text are all interconnected with the history of Western society. This is something that we need to think about. So if that is the development of uh, historical development of humanities, the other term that we need to think about is also a development that happened largely in the West. So digital technology and the development of digital, and that's the first term in the, the kind of com combined uh, phrase, digital humanities, you have uh, the term digital that needs a bit of understanding before we go on to explore the question of digital humanities. So what do we mean when we say digital technology? It's a mode of transmission of data in a code represented by two states on or off presence or absence of electrical voltage represented by one and zero, which is together called binary digits. For example, digital mobile phone converts sound into binary code of one or zero and sends it as on off electrical impulse which then are reconverted into sounds at the receiving end. Obviously, these are the things that we study in our schools. Uh, however, uh, we have to connect it with our inquiry today. Since digital signal transmission does not resemble electrical signals generated in nature, it is less prone to errors due to line noise. Like say, for example, mechanical telephone that you use, uh, which is uh, connected by wires. So it has this line noise very often and electrical disturbances caused by natural phenomena such as weather and sunspot. Every reproduction of digital data is an exact facsimile of the original because it's a code and not a waveform that is copied. So the mode in which information is transmitted becomes extremely accurate, extremely fast and very, very easy to reproduce and replicate. So you can see that, that in technology itself, you have all these possibilities hidden. So when I send a PDF of a book to you as a student, I am not actually giving away my book. The book stays with me. It's a copy that is transmitted, which is exact replica of the one that I have on my own PC. So you can see that giving book, maybe if you uh, try to think of the hard printed book, if I give my book to a student and it's likely that it's not written, it's gone forever, which is not the case with the digitally recorded text that we often use today. This technological development took off only in 1960s when integrated circuits and microprocessors were invented, which can process data into a code and back into data almost instantaneously. So digital communication was first employed in telegraphy. Digital computing is representation of quantity, that is data, by two digit code. So digital computer represents every kind of data, text, graphic, number, sound, video, by presence or absence of electrical pulses of equal strength. All modern computers are digital. Because digital circuits and computer chips, since they need 
to handle only two numbers are much, much faster than analog ones in data processing. So this is what business dictionary has to say about what we mean by digital or digital technology. So you can see that on one hand, you have development of humanities happening in the West and which is deeply interconnected with print technology and the scholarship around print technology, which was asking questions about social historical context of that printed artifacts called books that we were using. Similarly, digital technology emerged in the West and it has got a whole uh, different range of possibilities that it has opened up. So when you bring these two together, what is it that it makes possible for us as students of humanities is the question that we primarily indulge in uh, while we think about digital humanities. Uh, From late 1970s, digital computers and electronics, which had been previously used, been the preserve of businesses and research institutions, started to become sufficiently inexpensive and compact due to the use at home. Subsequently, many types of information gained a digital equivalent. A laser disc could store film as digital video and digital sound. A digital recording could be purchased on a CD. Filmless cameras could be used to reproduce and produce digital photograph. The word also came to be applied for different type of media, digital radio. Most of the FM radio that we hear today is digital. Digital television are increasingly important methods of broadcasting. Uh, from 1969 to 1971, Intel developed Intel 4004, an early microprocessor that laid the foundation to microcomputer revolution that began in the 70s. So it's only during the 80s, if you look at the history of the digital technology, it's only in the 80s, late 80s and 90s, when PCs became uh, commonplace, that you started thinking of using this technological development in a big way to help us in solving some of the problems in print-based humanities. Uh, and uh, one thing that we need to bear in mind that because technology develops very rapidly and somebody has a kind of formula which says that it grows exponentially, the, exp the MRF, I forget the law, but it says that it develops exponentially. And we are also now to looking at something like com quantum computing, if which if uh, becomes if it becomes common, like the digital com computing is today, will completely transform the field. Uh, because com uh, quantum computing is a revolutionary breakthrough technology, which is not yet available to us uh, at uh, such a common, uh, in such a common way that we use digital today. So you have to keep in mind that uh, media is extremely fast in development. And you can see that humanities is not as fast in its development as the technology is. So uh, as society moved from print to post print era, which is today towards the end of 20th century, the primary archive of literary studies started shifting from print to the post print and global domains of production, consumption and circulation, something called digital public sphere produced by digital revolution. The idea that text no longer remains a primarily print oriented one. The notion of text mutated into something known as hypertext. So you can see even the object of study, that is the text, uh, has changed uh, its form. It's now hypertext. Means uh, it's no longer just that you study Shakespeare as a written printed text, but if you uh, go online and you will find digital uh, 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 digital archives of Shakespeare, then you will see that uh, what happens there is that it's not just printed thing. It's a hypertext connected phenomenon. So it will be uh, connecting video, audio and so on and so forth. Uh, ideologically, this development of uh, the post print humanities that began in towards the end of 1990s is that it's associated with the rise of neoliberal global capitalism and global ideological conflicts. And uh, you have very famous uh, new formulation of geopolitics emerging after the 1990s 
uh, very famous uh, reorientation is found in uh, Samuel Huntington's uh, famous essay called A Clash of Civilizations, where, where he talks about uh, how uh, the conflict is no longer between the uh, Soviet Union and America, but between the West and Islamic countries. So you can see there is a reorientation of geopolitics happening in the 90s. And you can also see that there is new economical thinking called neoliberal global capitalism, which sees that market is primarily a self-regulating mechanism and it works for greater good if it is not interfered with. So market is given the primacy in uh, political economy of nation. So this market centric approach to thinking about societies is what we understand by neoliberal global capitalism. So you can see that the post print humanities emerges in the time of these ideological developments. So it's no, uh, no longer the public sphere of Habermas, which was largely a print sphere. Instead of that, we have something like digital public sphere. The text is no longer the same thing. The text now is something like hypertext. So you can see that there are certain fundamental shifts happening in the basic of our cultural history, the text and the public sphere that has happened because of this digital revolution. Hence, one aspect of digital humanities is about digital methodologies of producing, publishing, creating, curating, digital archives, textual representation in markup languages uh, for its primary sources. So instead of what we had textual criticism that we studied, uh, that was a field of scholarship for print based humanities. Instead of that, we have this new modes of textual representations in various new markup languages like HTML, as some of you may be familiar with. While the other is about making and incorporating digital computing tools in researching, generating knowledge. That is, distant reading of very large data sets, publishing the findings in form of graph, maps, and trees, as Franco Moretti does, and is something that we will see in the course of our presentation today. These activities can no longer be limited to traditional brick and mortar education institutions like the MOOCs, for example. Think about MOOCs, think about YouTube video, think about webinars like the one that we are doing. And you can see that all these things are possible because of digital revolution. So I think now we are able to ask the question that we are trying to figure out. What do we mean by digital humanities? And interestingly, there is no one definition of digital humanities. In fact, you will find entire website devoted to hundreds of definitions of digital humanities. So it's a discipline that is in search of its definition. It's not a discipline which has got a fixed definition. However, we have a kind of general understanding of what it is. Digital humanities is the work at the intersection of digital technology and humanities discipline. Digital humanities refers to new modes of scholarship and institutional units for collaborative and transdisciplinary computationally engaged research and te teaching and publication. DH is less a unified field than an array of convergent practices that explore a universe in which print is no longer the primary medium in which knowledge is produced and disseminated. So the main use of digital tools for purpose of humanistic research and communication does not qualify as digital humanities. For example, this webinar, which uses digital technology to discuss humanities is not uh, an example of digital humanities, nor is using WhatsApp to uh, sharing WhatsApp videos a form of digital humanities. Uh, it is to be understood as the study of digital artifacts, new media and contemporary culture in place of physical artifacts, old media and historical culture. So you can see that it's also important to keep in mind what it is not. So what is it not? It's not just merely using these technological tools for communication, right? It's but it's more about designing tools. It's more about creating tools that will enhance 
the scope of humanities. I think that is one way of understanding what humanity, digital humanities means. So one, this is a kind of rough uh, uh, definition, maybe working definition of uh, digital humanities, that it works at intersection of digital technologies and humanities disciplines, including all the kinds like archaeology, like uh, philosophy, like whatnot. So literary studies is a smaller part of humanities. That is something that we need to keep in mind. So uh, students of literature would be more focusing on use of digital tools in literary studies, while an archaeologist or a social scientist may have to use these tools in a very different way. So something that we need to keep in mind. We can also, uh, what I want to do right now is also to give you certain examples of uh, digital humanities. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go online and going to point out certain examples of digital humanities projects. Uh, and you can compare how those texts uh, work in contrast with the text that you use in your own classrooms as students of literature as well as as teachers of literature. So let me go online and give you an example. So let me share it from you. Sir, it, it is visible. Yes. It is visible. Is it visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All okay. your windows are visible. OK, OK. Yeah, so can you see this electronic Beowulf? Hmm. Right. So uh, this electronic Beowulf is uh, one exciting digital humanities project. Beowulf is, as many of you would be aware, uh, one of the earliest heroic poems in English literature written in English, old English, a form of English that uh, is very difficult for us to grasp today. So here is the digital version of Beowulf. And uh, let's take a look at what it offers for us as students of literature, apart from very fascinating cover that he has uh, given. The other project is this digital Jane Austen. Can you see this? Please tell me if you're not able to see the screen. Visible, sir. It's visible, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the net is slightly slow, so maybe it's not. Uh, yeah. So this is the uh, 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 electronic Beowulf, right? On uh, one side of screen, you can see the ancient manuscript as it actually was. So unlike the print humanities that you use in school, maybe maybe you studied some part of Beowulf in your college as part of your old English, or you may have studied something about Beowulf in your preparation for net examination, uh, but you don't get a sense of what it actually is as a artifact till you can see it here. Nor can you get a sense of how what kind of English was used in those days unless you are dealing with teachers who are exceedingly competent in old English and we can uh, all of us know that we don't have so many teachers in India who are competent with old English. So this website can also give you a sense of how this poem sounded when it was composed. So I'm just turning it on so you can hear this. How this is the first uh, First stands up, Bill. How will it sound? Are you able to hear?
sir it's not audible is it audible no sir so what i say is that in case in case you are not able to hear uh, the oral uh, recitation of this poem you can go online on your own phones or laptops and look at this uh, website called ebeowulf.uky.edu and you can get a sense of how the old english sounds uh, why is this important and interesting is that probably even those students who don't have access to uh, teachers who are competent in old english can get a sense of how english sounded 1000 years ago and how much has it changed today so it's getting kind of first hand experience of uh, beowulf something which would not have been possible in a country like ours so you can see that you preparation of this kind of website which is an archive with audio with video with uh, photographs is a project that is a typical digital humanities project so you can see that what is being offered here is creation of a website so if you are using this as a student like i am doing right now that is not digital humanities it's more if i'm designing a online tool like this a web web page like this an archive like this then that is called digital humanities so this will give you a certain sense of what digital humanities mean now you can see that there are multiple uh, jane austen uh, this is digital jane austen collection where you can get uh, get to see her manuscripts that she had written with her own hands and the first edition of the books there are many such sites which offer the students and the researchers uh, to engage with the text in a very different way from the way we did in our college and school because these kind of online tools are available for us so this is to give you a sense of what digital humanities makes possible for us so let's go back to uh, our effort to understand digital humanities so you can see the shift that has happened in the way we do humanities due to technological revolution right so this is what we need to keep in mind when we start exploring the questions of digital humanities okay and as we said in the beginning that digital humanities is not a singular kind of project it does not have single thing but it's a diversified field and it's an evolving field that's what we said in the beginning so let's look at how it started and what are the ways in which it went on so it's a good idea to take a look at the history of the emergence of digital humanities right because in order to get a better understanding of what a particular uh discipline is it's a good idea to visit its history just like we did it for the sake of uh, uh traditional humanities so these are uh, people have thought of digital humanities in terms of certain waves so the first wave of digital humanities began in the late 90s and early 21st century <clears throat> the focus was on large scale digitization projects and the establishment of technological infrastructure like the like the two websites that we saw uh, so the first wave is when the print or written textual material is transferred to the digital sphere and a technological infrastructure is created to host this platforms are created to host this uh print material in digitized form 
So the second wave of digital humanities, what can be called digital humanities 2.0, is a deeply generating, creating environments and tools for producing, curating, interacting with knowledge that is born digital and lives in various digital contexts, which means the second wave of digital humanities uses now starts preparing tools and technologies to read the material that is now available in digital domain instead of trying to transfer the first uh, written and print into the digital now you are creating technologies and tools to study them so that's the second wave of digital humanities so while the first wave of digital humanities concentrates somewhat, somewhat narrowly on text analysis, such as creating classification system, markup, text encoding, and scholarly editing within the established discipline, the Digital Humanities 2.0 introduces entirely new disciplinary paradigms, convergent fields, hybrid technologies, and even new publication models that are not often derived from or limited to print culture. So what do we mean by when I say not derived or even limited to print culture? We'll see when I give you an example of a contemporary digital humanities project that will be clearer to you as we proceed. But for us as Indians, it is uh, important to keep in mind that we have not even started. Most of our textual and print material that we have in India today is not transferred to the digital domain. And because print technology entered India very late in 19th century. So not, it's not very historically accurate to say 19th century because uh, it came with Portuguese uh, colonialism in the 17th century, but it took on in a massive way only after the establishment of colonial rule in India. So you can see it's fairly recent. It's only 200 years old. Printing technology in India is very young compared to printing technology in the West. It started out, if, as many of you may be aware, of Gutenbergian revolution in the 13th century, probably. And all of us have heard of Caxton and how he was the first uh, printer uh, to publish and print literature. So uh, Caxton's uh, collection, Ca Caxton's publication of uh, Canterbury Tales is very famous and Caxton's publication of, of uh, Shakespeare is also very famous. So you can see that compared to the West, print technology came to India fairly late and literacy rates, though now they are on the rise, have been fairly marginal compared to the West. And why are we saying all this is because a uh, huge amount of textual material is already available in the West in the print form. So later on, you develop technologies to transfer it to digital domain by various technologies and archaeology and, and archives of various kinds. So uh, Project Gutenberg is a very famous uh, website which hosts most of the texts which are out of copyright laws. So you can see it's a huge archive, Project Gutenberg. Uh, compared to that, India is still struggling to produce uh, what should I say, deeply entrenched print sphere and then transfer it to the digital domain. This is just a comparative perspective that we need to keep in mind. So looking at these waves of digital humanities, the first wave of DH involved the building of infrastructure in studying of the humanities text through digital uh, repositories like Project Gutenberg, say for example text markup and so on, whereas the second wave expands the notional limits of the archive to include digital works to bring to bear humanity's own methodological toolkits to look at digital material, born digital material, such as electronic literature, interactive fiction, web-based artifacts and so on. So uh, what you need to keep in mind is that digital humanities 2.0 manifesto that I have mentioned in this slide brought out by Snap and Pressner is in 2010. Uh, it is 2020 now, so you can see that it's already being dated. It's, it sounds dated today. So we have gone beyond these waves. We are now into the third or even fourth wave of DH. Uh, 
scholars like david berry have talked about the digital humanities coming into the next phase where uh, you can think of dh 3.0 that is the third wave of digital humanities around the underlying computationality of forms held within a computational medium uh, i call this the computational turn in digital humanities so the third way of dh according to berry is when computationality of the form becomes primary that means you saw the uh, electronic beowulf now that is a compute that is a form that is a genre that is uh, one of the online forms of beowulf being presented so what is the computational aspect of creating those kinds of archives is what we focus upon when we study digital humanities in this third view so berry goes on to say i propose to look at the digital components of the digital humanities in the light of its medium specificity as a way of thinking about how medial changes produce epistemic changes so what he means to say is how when you start looking at what are the algorithms that have gone into making of uh, project beowulf for example and uh, how by putting such a form online how are people able to think about beowulf differently is what uh, david berry would be interested so compared to print how is this kind of experience of uh, this new genre which is produced by new media uh, how what are the epistemological changes that have taken place because of this shift is what dh studies in dh 3.0 so going back to the history then one of the earliest projects of uh, dh was perseus project uh, and you can see that uh, it's a library project of tuff university and uh, it's a project that assembles digital collection of humanities resources but mostly it consists of classics the greek and the latin so it's a kind of archive of classics online archive of classics now it was also published in as two cd roms in the age when cds were popular uh the project has expanded its original scope and now it has current collections have greco roman classics as well as the english renaissance so this is one of the earliest project perseus project so this is the web page of perseus project another such project was uh, northeastern university women's writers project uh, by brown university women writers project it started in 18 1986 and as the title indicates it is uh, an archive of women's writing from 16th century to 19th century so these are the two examples of early projects of digital humanities so in the 21st century we communicate in media significantly more varied extensive and multiplicative than linear text compared to print that is uh, from scalable database to information visualization serious contents and rigorous argumentation take shape across multiple platforms and media critically informed literacy is expansive enough to include graphic design visual narrative time based media and, and development of interfaces now move to front and center as much as the advent of dh implies reinterpretation of humanities as a generative enterprise is something that you need to underline one in which students and faculty alike are making things as they study and perform research not just and generating not just text so it's not just about writing or coding programs to put up a website like uh, project beowulf but it's also what is the logic that has gone into making such website what are the decisions that are taken and why are what is the ideological dimension about how does it look visually to us 
and in what way do students and researchers negotiate ask questions about this new genres is also at the center of dh today that's what she means so you can see that generative enterprise is about producing text and what are the texts being produced the texts being produced is are the archives like this but also research on those archives <coughs> so a researcher who uses this digital tools produces knowledge which becomes the secondary kind of knowledge and that knowledge is also not so much in print domain it's also in the form of hypertextual material it's also in the form of website a blog right so you can see that uh, a secondary material in traditional humanities was also in print so a typical phd project in traditional humanities would first think of coming up with an archive and then think of methodology and then go on doing something like literature review uh, which involves reading in the library and from the bookstores and then formulating your research questions so this is the traditional method of uh, traditional humanities but once you have text which is not in print but it's online then the research questions that you ask is also tends to be different from the earlier one means now you are asking questions like what are the computing side of this web project what are the kinds of codes that are being written in terms of programming what are the algorithms that go into it why what are the decisions that have gone into selection of colors sounds and so on and so forth so you can see that you are asking a different set of questions now after asking these questions you are producing your research and that is also in the form of blogs or in the form of websites or in the forms of the word document so the nature of your secondary uh, material also has changed so uh, this is just uh, something more about digital humanities as a generative practice and uh, uh, what anna burdick and joanna drucker seems to be saying is that these websites like the one that i showed you are embodied performance of an argument there is already an argument made in such a website right when it is shown to you so by just looking at that website maybe our research question now is what is that argument that has gone into making of this archive right so you can see that uh, the making of this archive itself is an argument so the outcome of your research project may also be another archive or archive like this for example that's just one example of it this is just one way of doing dh not the only way of course so designing is the one of the key words the big d according to burdick and drucker when it comes to digital humanities so designing what and designing websites such as electronic bible and the argument is that this designing involves an argument it involves a theoretical perspective so theory is not something that is separate from practice theory is something that has gone into making of this text online text right so this is the generative definition of digital humanities where designing such tools becomes primary and according to these scholars burdick and trucker this also uh, has an impact on society and culture it remaps reinterprets reframes and reveals patterns deconstructs reconstructs situates and critiques the material that you are putting up for example maybe when you are preparing say for example uh, a digital archive of mahabharat then maybe you may want to highlight gender in certain way uh, in the way people access this text right so uh, the argument has gone into making of your archive itself and it has got a certain impact on culture 
and they go on to argue that it doesn't mean that every digital humanities will become a designer but every good digital humanities has to be able to read and appreciate which design has to offer to build a shared vocabulary and mutual respect that can lead to fruitful collaborations understanding the rhetoric of design its persuasive force and central role in shaping of argument it's a critical tool for digital work in all disciplines it means that uh, if you are doing research in digital humanities it doesn't mean that you should become uh, an effective designer but you should be able to appreciate understand the meaning of designing and you should be also able to understand uh, the significance of the whole question of designing your project uh which of course someone else will do if necessary and they also talk of something called rhetoric of design it's persuasive force for example when we looked at the audio old english audio of it then uh, there was an argument there that beowulf is not just a written manuscript it's an old english performance it's an old english poem that was recited and sung right so and you can see that unlike studying beowulf in english class uh, or think about chaucer for example in uh, traditional humanities classroom in india where we think chaucer is a printed object right so the rhetoric of design in a printed text is that it's uh, something to be read while the rhetoric of design in uh, text like uh, electronic beowulf is that it is a performance besides we can also see the historicity when we look at uh, such kind of i'm just going back to show you uh, uh, this electronic beowulf that on one side you see the transcription of uh, the old english poem on the other side you can see that it's a manuscript right which is preserved in certain way and how old it is so you can get a sense of its historicity by looking at it something that is not available to you when you study say for example the print version of beowulf so these are some of the fundamental activities of dh which includes curation analysis editing modeling and so on Uh, it involves archiving collections repository aggregation of materials curation is selection and organization of such material in an interpretative framework an argument or exhibit analysis or processing of text or data statistical and quantitative methods of analysis have brought close reading of text that is stylometrics genre analysis collation comparison and so on in dialogue with something called distant reading which we'll talk about at some length uh, in the course of this presentation uh, one thing i need to emphasize here at this point that if you look at the project such as this uh uh we have to keep in mind that it's not the work of a single university or a single department or it's not even a thing that involves two or three scholars but it can have global collaboration because digital domain is a global domain uh, a person sitting in china or in india can also collaborate with people sitting in scandinavia and in new zealand to produce this kind of uh, humanities project digital humanities project so digital humanities because it's based on digital platform is immensely is immensely collaborative so research is not just what one person does in the corner of his library anymore the second thing that i want to emphasize is because you are engaging with material and technology that is digital it is inherently interdisciplinary it's not just your knowledge of humanities that is required but also your knowledge of digital technology which obviously you cannot master say for example then you will require technical help you will need programmers people who write programs you will need people who can operate computers far more efficiently than you do so it by default is interdisciplinary and it's collaborative this is something that i want to emphasize uh then we can think of analysis of 
such text and visualization something that i will explain later what is editing i'm not going into detail because of uh, lack of time here but these are some of the activities okay so this is one of the main ideas and uh, for students of literature this is very interesting <coughs> because if you look at digital uh, traditional humanities then one of the central practices of traditional humanities is close analysis of the text close reading is one of the central practice explication the text right uh, something that becomes the cornerstone of new criticism but also of deconstruction later on close reading is the cornerstone of traditional humanities and uh, what incorporation of technology makes possible is the possibility of distant reading in a very powerful way so we need to understand what do we mean when we say distant reading uh close reading has its roots in philological traditions of humanities but for more than generation or so it has been equated with deep hermeneutics exegesis techniques in which interpretations are excavated from text distant reading is a term popularized by frank moretti which explicitly ignores the specific features of individual text that close reading concentrates upon in favor of gleaming larger trends and patterns from corpus of text so you can see that the unit of analysis for traditional humanities was the text and uh, it was uh, the job of the researcher to focus on what it makes it distinctive in terms of style in terms of technique in terms of themes but distant reading focuses not on single text but maybe millions of text there is a shift in the object of research and these million texts are those which are digitized and how can you study it obviously not individually but more as more through computing and you can see that what is happening here is franco moretti brings back in a major way quantitative methods for research something that were on the sidelines of traditional humanities let's see what he has to say franco moretti says this when the study of national bibliographies was made uh, we realized what a minimal fraction of literary field we all work on a canon of 200 novels for instance for instance sounds very large for 19th century britain and is much larger than the current one <clears throat> but is still less compared to 1% of the novels that were actually published 20000 30 or more or no one really knows close reading won't help us here a novel a day every day would take a century or so so it's not even a matter of time but of a method a field which is large cannot be understood by stitching together separate bits of knowledge about individual cases uh, because it isn't a sum of individual cases it's a collective system that should be grasped as such as a whole within that old territory called literature a new object of study instead of concrete individual works instead of that what we have is trio of artificial constructs maps graphs and trees in which the reality of the text undergoes a process of deliberate reduction and abstraction digital reading i'm sorry distant reading where distance however is not an obstacle but a specific form of knowledge fewer elements and hence sharper sense of overall interconnection comes through that's what he says what he seems to be indicating that our traditional method of studying literature was in his word something very theological <clears throat> you need to have a deep understanding of the poem that you studied or novel that you studied and then you started taking that as a sample and make generalizations about the period in which it was written you read one novel by jane austen say pride and prejudice and then start drawing conclusion about the cultural context however in those days hundreds and hundreds of novels were written and your sample size is minimal but in even then you are making uh, drawing conclusions based on that on a very very small sample size that becomes one of the limitations of traditional humanities and that can be overcome using distant reading here 
uh, and he uses it to study something called world literature, where literature is seen as a planetary system, not uh, merely a national phenomena, but a kind of global phenomena, literature as a global phenomena. So what he did was he first he plotted annual publishing rate of the novels into graphs and discovered, among other things, that the genre did not experience a single rise, as is often argued, but went through several cycles of growth and retrenchment. He then went on to create maps and diagrams of fictional British villages and used them to explore how rural class struggle, industrialization and state formation altered the narrative structure of the period's novels. And finally, he drew upon evolutionary theories and used tree diagrams to argue that success of Conan Doyle's home stories stemmed from author's skillful use of clues. And he represented it, something called data visualization. So there is something like data analysis, and uh, analysis is then transferred in the form of visualization, in the form of graphs, trees, and so on. So let's take a look at some of them. So this is the rise of British novel. So you can see what uh, uh, Moretti is trying to do is he's trying to come up with different way of understanding literary history. The traditional literary history does not account for, say, for example, why is it that between 1967 to 1980, there was a sudden drop in the novel, number of novels published. You have to explain that. And then why do you find after 19... Well, by the time you come to 1830 or 1825, there is a huge rise in the uh, number of novels that were published. So you can see that you are now approaching literary history from a very different angle. Now, this is a very interesting uh, data visualization provided by uh, Priya Joshi about book imports into India. Now you can see that book Im import into India from 1850 onwards, there is a sudden rise after, by the time you reach 1860. And one of the ways you can explain is because universities started in India in 1857. But then there is a huge fall up to 1870s. There is a huge fall. So how do you account for this huge fall? And then you can see that then graph continues to rise slowly but gradually. Though it may remind you of uh, Corona statistics these days. So this is one way of doing digital humanities by represent uh, taking very big data sets and then analyzing them using computers and then representing your findings in terms of graphs and trees. There are other kinds of projects. For example, Dan Cohen and Fred Gibbs won one of the Google's DH research awards for ambitious project named Reframing the Victorians. And they are currently using text mining techniques to examine titles of 1.6 billion books published during the long 19th century. So you can see that uh, your David Dacius history or Sanders history would teach 19th century Victorian period in certain way. But if you are able to study all the books published in 19th century, which is 1.6 million books, which is not humanly possible to read, then you can come up with a very different way of doing literary history. So what they did, Cohen and Gibbs, by plotting and graphing the frequency of words such as progress, science and faith and modern, they have been able to visualize some key ideas and force that shape Victorian culture. Other example is that uh, by the Harvard scientists is a particular brand of DH, the name called cultural anomics, uh, developed by Jean Baptiste Michel, etc., in what is known as quantitative analysis of culture using millions of digitized books. So you can see that you are not studying two novels in the classroom. Right. And uh, look at your own PhD projects and how many books you are studying and compare it with the number of books these people are studying using digital tools, which will give you a sense of what is possible using technology. Their study, their text mined a corpus of five million digitized books and quantified the evolution of grammar, the speed at which society forgets its past 
and absorption and adoption of new technology, the effects of censorship and changing nature of fame. This is what uh, they have to say about after text mining this five million copies. Then there are other genres and methods of DH like thick mapping and locative investigation, uh, distributed knowledge production, humanities gaming, code software and platform studies, database documentaries, ubiquitous scholarship and so on and so forth. There are multiple such things. Some of the criticisms levied against DH. For example, there is a tendency not to focus so much on questions of class, race, gender and sexuality, which was one of the important developments in humanities research in traditional humanities, at least after 1960s. Uh, preference for research driven projects over pedagogical ones. That means it doesn't pay enough attention to pedagogical aspects of it. And there is also an absence of political commitment an inadequate level of diversity among its practitioner, which means most of them are white based in very rich universities with huge amount of funding. And also an inability to address text under copyright and institutional concentration in well funded research universities. Uh, so how will you uh, crunch or data crunch texts which are protected under copyright. That is, you cannot study novel after 1970 using uh, these methods because you cannot just digitize those texts and then write programs to read them because you will have to pay for them. So there are ten many kinds of tensions within DH. There is an overlap between the fields that which have been called digital humanities between scholars who use digital technologies in studying traditional humanities objects and those who use methods in contemporary humanities to study digital objects. But clear differences lie between them. Means those people who use technology to read something which was primarily print like Franco Moretti, like Priya Joshi, they are using new tools to study older archives which were largely print based but there is also another set of researchers who study digital objects which are born digital so there is this this is one tension those differences produce significant tension particularly between those who suggest dh should be about making whether making archives or tools or dh method and those who argue that it must expand to include interpreting this is what Kathleen Fitzpatrick says. So this brings us finally to the question of DH in India and Indian society is no longer isolated from larger global developments as uh, now it should be clear that a virus which leaked somewhere in Wuhan has brought the entire world including the place where we live in into lockdown. So we are so globally interconnected and the digital world has made deep inroads into Indian society in form of smartphones, social media, gaming, online education, e-commerce. Hence, the study of humanities cannot afford to stay isolated from this global de development. And this is one of the reasons behind this presentation that we should at least have a kind of understanding of the field, even if it is very limited. While traditional humanities in India ha has been around only for one and a half centuries compared to seven to eight centuries in the West, the traditional humanities goes back to Cambridge and Oxford, you know, founding of Oxford universities. The four decade old digital humanities in India has not really taken root. Uh, the massive quantitative growth of acad uh, humanities academics has resulted in significant, has not uh, resulted in significant qualitative growth as system is beset with corruption, lethargy and apathy. The larger academic world of humanities in India is large, la rather underdeveloped in terms of critical thinking, methodological rigor and sheer honest hard work. It is far more lacking in terms in expertise in computing. Hence the fruitful convergence between two is going to be very rare. Uh, however, some organizations are doing commendable job by trying to bring about the convergence between analog and digital humanities. And these organizations are School of Text Records and Record Texts, Cultural Texts and Records, Jadavpur University, which is a kind of uh, one of the most important place for comparative literature uh, as a 
students of comparative literature know and it's almost associated with a new renaissance so yeah, digital humanities renaissance is happening with jadavpur university the center of internet studies then dhai digital humanities association of india then you have koti women's college which offer 3 year ba program in dh and srishti university bangalore offers an ma with dh so let's look at one university uh, which is one of the most important one it's school of cultural texts and records jadavpur university which i call bengal yon renaissance in indian digital humanities the school of cultural texts and records began functioning in january 2004 and its approved activities must include ed editing manuscript printed texts especially those requiring multidisciplinary inputs in electronic and print preparing databases bibliographies concordance index hang list and so on it also studies history of publishing and printing press especially in bengal and in india as a whole something what we call history of book uh, which is one of the upcoming areas of research the history of the book recording oral literature oral history interviews and other oral cross modal cross segmental documentation collection of ephemera political and commercially publicity material job printing etc etc so developing the resources for cultural informatics in india by accessing and developing appropriate technology for above activities so these are some of the things that the jadavpur university does and this is what it has it has papers of buddhadev bose uh, arun kumar badal sarkar naresh gua all very important bengali writers desh very important periodical archives early bengali drama musical archives of north indian music street literature personal literature um so personal narratives of partition of india and so on the school also has table 1.000 version release of what it's called prabhed collation pack and we will see what it is in the last thing that i will be showing you which includes the gross collation software chhatra bongo a fine collation tool the tafat uh, and a tri tier result display system and this version is available for 32 bit as well as 62 bit operating system so currently work going on is upgrading the logic of gross collation tools in chhatra bongo so in order to get a sense of what all this is we'll take a look at their leading project and that is project vichitra so this is a short video clip on project vichitra with which i will end my presentation but uh, it will give you a sense of how the project works This is the voice of Rabindranath Tagore himself.
Yes, so this is my presentation on uh, digital humanities and you can see how Project Bichitra <coughs> uh, incorporates all the important uh, ideas that we have been discussing, like collaborative nature of DH, like uh, preparation of tools and designing, a very different approach to editorial practices, almost a new way of doing uh, editing a book uh, or a text. Uh, most of the things that we have been discussing are raised in the course of uh, this project. You could also see how uh, it is collaborative. It's not an activity of one person. It involved uh, technical support from people under the age of 35, as well as senior scholars who were trained in the traditional humanities discipline. So, you, uh, so these are some of the ideas regarding digital humanities, and this project seems to illustrate those ideas. So with this, I want to stop here my presentation. And again, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Banerjee for, and Gnosis Journal for giving me an opportunity to share these ideas. We can now take the questions uh, for this.